live and ready to begin. So I'm going to start recording up here just in case we might need that later. And we'll get back to our notes, we'll get some lights off up front where we can see the screen a little bit better and we'll get under underway momentarily here. I'll find the right button to get me back on. And so last night we were looking at Yom Kippur and so uh, in the Jewish world of modern times that's how they refer to this uh, the coming week's event, Yom Kippur. Uh, uh, typical way for some of the New York Jews to pronounce it, but uh, today we want to look at the Day of Atonement from the Word of God. And so the most important figures for this biblical Day of Atonement are the High Priest, the Holy of Holies, and the two goats. Last night we read of many other sacrifices that were going to be made on this day, but for the sake of the people and, and of uh, the whole system here, the, the three most important things was uh, the high priest, the Holy of Holies, and the two goats. One was a goat for Adonai, and the other was a goat for Azazel. The high priest wore all white on this day when he went in before Adonai into the Holy of Holies to carry the blood of the offerings unto, unto God. And the white reflects the idea of purity and holiness and the purity of holiness that is sought by all people and that which belongs to God himself. There was a laver, a big laver out in the courtyard for the priest seen a lot of different depictions of this thing, so it's like a, a huge vessel with spat, spigots all around it to constantly wash their hands and feet, so one's high for the hand, one low for the feet. What exactly it looked like, uh, I can't imagine. My mind doesn't work that way, but uh, I'd like to see what other people imagine this would look like. And so they would continually wash their hands and their feet as they conducted sacrifices to worship for God. So the high priest is going to do several of them. He goes in and out of the Holy of Holies, uh, according to the Jewish understanding of this thing, four times. And every time he comes out and he washes again. Washes and changes clothes. Washes and changes clothes. And so up to ten times washing and changing clothes, according to others. And so back and forth between the lava and the altar burnt offering, as well as the golden altar of incense, the table of showbread, the menorah, and into the Holy of Holies. So he had a number of things he had to do on that day. But the first thing the high priest had to do on the Day of Atonement was to atone for his own sins, that of his family and of his tribe. And so whether or not we understand, as some do, uh, that he first for himself and then uh, for his uh, family and tribe separately from himself or not, uh, a lot of different ideas on this. So I'm not going to follow my sword over any of them, but nonetheless he had to make atonement first of all for himself and for the priesthood and then also for the people. Once they'd been atoned and there was the purification of the temple, uh, the golden altar of incense, the bronze altar of burnt offerings, everything was being cleansed on the Day of Atonement. So part of this picture uh, outlined in Leviticus 16 has to do with purification of the temple sanctuary and its most important vessels due to the sins of the priests and of the people. Uh, they continued to use this throughout the year, and it was constant coming and going because of sin. And so it was like we needed to cleanse this up real good once every year, so to speak. And their sins created impurity, which resulted in the need to purify the temple or the Mishkan, the tabernacle, once a year. The high priest first purify himself, the priesthood, and then the people. For only a pure individual could purify the holy sanctuary and his vessels. So we're going to focus today on the high priest, the two goats, and the red ribbon turned white. Uh, this is from the Mishnah, by the way. The idea of the red ribbon turned white is Jewish uh, rabbinic literature from the Mishnah, the oral traditions written down speaks of this. And so the main passage we'll be considering is Leviticus 16, 1 through 34. We'll read as we go along. Uh, we should note there's uh, not a, a change. We should note a change in emphasis over the years. When we study here in Leviticus 16 and what is emphasized today in the Jewish world, modern Jewish world, are not the same. What we consider this morning is emphasis during the time when there was either a Mishkan or temple present. And so what the, in the Jewish world they emphasize today is how do we do this without a temple? And so Yom Kippur, uh, without having a way to go and have these sacrifices made. The Jewish study Bible, uh, this is an actual Jewish Bible. It only goes through Malachi, although the order of the books are different. Noted regular atonement for unintentional sin and the routine eradication of impurity eliminate as much of both types of defilement as possible. Yet, since not all unintentional wrongs are discovered, and not everyone is diligent about atonement, a certain amount of defilement remains. 
So in particular, deliberate crimes which contaminate the inner sanctum where the divine presence itself is said to dwell are not expurgated by the regular atonement rituals. This chapter thus provides the instructions for purging the inner sanctum along with the rest of the tabernacle once a year so that defilement does not accumulate. It logically follows the laws of purification, chapters 12 through 15 of Leviticus, as they conclude with a statement that only by preventing the spread of impurity can the Israelites in, in, ensure God's continual presence among them. So this is Jewish commentary. The an, annual purification ritual, briefly alluded to in Exodus 30, verse 10, is to be performed on the 10th day of the 7th month. Elsewhere, this day is referred to as Yom HaKippurim, often translated as Day of Atonement, uh, with the verb kipper, atone, being used in the sense to decontaminate the sacred precincts of sin or defilement. So it has to do with all of the above. You're cleansing the priesthood, you're cleansing the people, and you're cleansing the means by which they can approach the true and the living God in those days. So verses 1 and 2, the appointed time for the Holy of Holies. Now Adonai spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aharon, when they had approached the presence of Adonai and died. Very important statement. They, they didn't approach God the right way, the right time, and in God's prescribed way. And so they died. Adonai said to Moshe, tell your brother Aharon that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place, uh, inside the veil. And so that describes for us the holy of holies as we would normally speak of it. Separated from the rest of the holy place by the parochet, a veil that is described in the Mishnah as being so thick and so heavenly woven that you could tie two horses to the opposite ends and, and try to make them part that, that uh, parochet and they couldn't. So you're talking about a very thick veil. And so inside the veil means inside the Holy of Holies, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark. And that further describes that inside the Holy of Holies, or he will die. If Aaron goes in the wrong time, he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So the rites for this holy day of atonement are introduced with the death of Nadab and Avihu. And so if even if Aaron approached God, uh, in a wrong way, he would also die. He must do it the way the Bible says. So it's stated twice in our text that he will die. Nave and Avihu approached God on their own volition. Uh, they just decided they were going to go in there. They were going to take fire in their fire pans. They were going to put incense on their fire pans and go in and worship God. At that point in time, when God was first setting up this tabernacle, it was Aharon and Aharon only responsibility to offer the incense before God. So they usurped. Uh, the role of the high priest. And furthermore, they uh, are said in two or three places to have offered strange fire. The coals for this should have come off that brazen altar of sacrifices and only from that particular location. And so they offered also strange fire. So this emphasized at the same time how serious were the functions of the priesthood and how important it was to do things God's way and just how holy our God truly is. And so I've already talked about this idea of the strange fire a little bit. So the main emphasis of Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, and Numbers 3, 4, and, and 26, 60, 61 is uh, they offered strange fire before Adonai. So those three locations. The emphasis of our present text is concerned with approaching God outside at the appointed time. There's an appointed time. You don't rush in the Holy of Holies except at the appointed time. That's once a year on the day of Yom Kippur. That they burned incense and they approached the face of Adonai, places Nadav and Avihu at the Parochet, which separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. There's a certain irony in God destroying them in the same way that they used to approach him by fire. Now God has a holy fire, they had a strange fire. And God's fire was greater than the fire of man. This re reminder also served as a warning as to the holiness of God in the appropriate way to approach him. It serves to explain just how serious the priestly function was. Uh, you don't come just any old time in any old way to worship your God and Creator. There were Moedim. A Moed, a single, Moedim, plural, appointed times and appointed ways, an order of worship which God Himself established. Man is always trying to figure out a way to make himself right with God apart from God's chosen way of doing it. Uh, there's only one way of atonement, there's only one God and only one way of access to the Father. All this is to point us toward the one. Whom the scripture will reveal, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua our Messiah. There's only one means to come into the presence of a holy God. And the fulfillment of this idea of David Atonement is going to be fulfilled in Yeshua when he comes 
much later, of course, than the passage we're reading from the book of Leviticus. Uh, the Hebrew term for Holy of Holies in Exodus 26.33 is Kedosh Kadesh HaKadoshim, Holy of Holies. So you have the word Kodesh doubled and implies increased sanctity, thus the construct or the word pair form of the Holy of Holies. So two words holy tied together to one another, a construct form in Hebrew. Here in Leviticus, the description is, the description is simply a holy place. Uh, in, in the book of Leviticus, or described as the place where the mercy seat, the caparets found. So we know it's the same holy of holies that is described in Exodus. The whole structure is referred to as the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting or tent of appointment. A Moed, an appointed time, an appointed place. So we come at the appointed times to meet with God. And he gives us unique appointments. So uh, we're at a point, uh, I've had an appointment to come to God. So in order to use this place, they had the twice daily sacrifice the Ola, the whole burnt offering of the lamb in the morning and the whole burnt offering of the lamb in the evening. And then they could come. So twice a day they were supposed to come. And the Hebrew people, after a, a period of time, developed the three times a day of prayer. How early was it? At least by Daniel's day. Because we read in Daniel that in chapter 6, as was his custom, he went after the king of Nebuchadnezzar had written this decree. Nobody can pray to anybody except the king. And he, knowing that this had been signed, he went and opened his windows toward Jerusalem, got down on his knees, and he prayed three times a day. And so the three times a day. So morning offering time, uh, the time of the morning, Ola, Shacharit, the time of the afternoon, uh, Ola, the Minka, and then the uh, Erev, the nighttime uh, prayers in association with uh, having to cleanse that altar off, get ready for the next day. So somebody had to stay up, make sure everything was burned up, cleaned up. And so three times a day of prayer. So morning, afternoon, and nighttime before you go to bed. And so we have once a day. Uh, we have uh, three times a day. We have once a week at Shabbat. And then we have these festivals that God has ordained to come before him. And on, only on this day, only on uh, Yom Kippur, do they go into that most holy place. And so inside there, this Ark of the Covenant, separated by this veil. And uh, the caparet, the mercy seat, uh, the covering or lid was made out of pure gold or beaten work with two cherubim facing each other. And he has to go in and sprinkle the blood uh, of the sacrifices upon this mercy seat to gain mercy and forgiveness. So the first commandment given is that Aharon is to enter the most holy place only at the appointed time. So all of this just about these first two verses. The reason is because God appears in the cloud over the mercy seat, the caparet. You don't just burst in the presence of God without uh, an appointment. Thank, praise God. He gave us an open access through Yeshua, our Messiah, to come whenever we need him. But until Yeshua died and rose again and gave us that access, you didn't just go rushing in the presence of God in that place where he was going to meet with man. That doesn't mean that you couldn't have gone to God in prayer. David prayed out in the woods. David prayed out in the sheepfold. Uh, people prayed to God all the time. That meant you couldn't pray. It meant you didn't go rushing into where God's presence was found at any old time. And so God appears in this cloud, and the holiness of God demands Aharon come only at the appointed time, any other time, in any other way. Would it be an affront to his holiness? It would result in Aharon's death. God has appointed time for atonement. That's the first big truth of this, an appointed time for atonement, once a year on the day of Yom Kippur. And there was a special appointed time for Yeshua, the Messiah, to come. He died at Passover, Passover time, but he's also our atonement. And the whole book of Hebrews is written concerning that matter, and particularly chapters 8, 9, and 10. It ties directly the death of Yeshua, our Messiah, to the day of atonement. So God has an appointed time. Uh, for that ancient people, it was always on Yom Kippur. For us, through Yeshua, the Messiah, he died for us at Passover, and he had made for us an atonement. The festival cycle of Moedim is the revelation of God's plan for salvation in its entirety completed in one year. So we'd know about his first coming, we'd know about his second coming. And so that the Kohen Gadol entered only once in this cycle in the most holy place foreshadowed the coming Yeshua at the appointed time to enter once and for all into, uh, into the uh, uh, work of obtaining eternal redemption. So the book of Hebrews then assures us in Hebrews 9, 11, 12, when Messiah appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So in behind the parochet of the place in heaven, after all, he told Moses, make according to the pattern I show you from here. You make that tabernacle to look like what it looks like here. And then Hebrews 10, 9 and 10, uh, then he said, behold, I've come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we be, have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua, the Messiah, once for all. So saved once for all time. Uh, because he went the appointed time to meet with God in that holy place in heaven. So a different time, but nonetheless uh, fulfilling uh, this important event. Verse 2 says, I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. And the clouds understood is the cloud of presence, as it was experienced at Sinai in their departure from Egypt and during all the wilderness wanderings. So in the wilderness wanderings, it talks about a cloud by day and a fire by night. And so some of the Jewish uh, exegetes understand it this way. On top of Mount Sinai, there, it was covered with a thick cloud. And they could see fire and flashes of lightning inside the cloud on top of Mount Sinai. So during the day, all you saw was the cloud. At night, what you saw was the fire. It was always the same cloud with the fire inside and the lightning flashing around. We read about uh, God's presence in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 2. We read about God's presence in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, and they describe like this bright glowing of God. And we find that also in the book of Revelation about Yeshua, a glowing brightness. And so this like fire, this uh, very bright fire uh, glowing. And so this, um, I'll appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So when the cloud gave off of that mercy seat and went out in front of the camp and said, it's time to go, they followed the cloud. But he was there above that cloud when they were sitting still. And it was the Shekinah. Uh, the word Shekinah is, comes from the Shekinah to sit, sell, or resign. Uh, and so they developed this term in the rabbinic literature of the personal presence of God and call it the Shekinah. Uh, the kavod, the, the glory, the heavy, the weightiness of, of God. Uh, this word kavod is a very unique word. The personal presence of God is described as a heaviness. And we read about that heaviness when ever someone sees God in some kind of manifest way, they fall down on their face because the heaviness is so great they can't stand before him. So this is a restriction uh, of a place here uh, where God is to be found. Targum Jonathan depicted the kavod as a cloud with fire burning inside of it. Uh, so the Targumim were written uh, most, for the most part uh, around the time of Yeshua. And this was put in Aramaic form, which tells us if it was written at the time of Yeshua in Aramaic, that must have been a uh, more common language to many of the Jewish people around the world, or they wouldn't have put it in Aramaic. And so they did this uh, to give kind of a, a running uh, commentary, so to speak, on what the Scripture was describing. So they depicted the kavod as a cloud with fire burning inside of it. Similar to the description of God's presence upon Sinai and the other places I've already mentioned. And so, I'm sorry, I, I depart from my notes quite often, and uh, we're 16 pages. We're not going to get through 16 pages. I promise I'm not going to go that fast, but we'll get where we get. The phrase concerning Aharon, lest he die or that he not die, is repeated in verses 12 through 13. So not only must the appointed Kohen Gadol, the high priest, uh, interesting, Kohen Gadol, the great priest, Gadol meaning great or, or it's often said high priest, come into the most holy place at the appointed time, but he must also come with more than just the blood of the sacrifice. He must bring incense and burn it upon the altar of incense in order to produce a cloud that would cover the mercy seat. So he takes this incense and a, and a snuffer. He burns some on that golden altar, and he takes this little snuffer to the doorway, to that opening between the pile of cat, and gets this big cloud of, uh, of incense uh, going. So when he goes in, he's shrouded from the presence of God. And so this is a very important part of it. As the book of Hebrews describes it, and as we've already known, the censor itself would be carried into the most holy place. The blood paid for the penalty of sin, but the incense is symbolic of the work of intercession necessary for applying the payment of the sacrifice of those who would be saved. And so these, this incense reflects the prayers of the people outside waiting 
to see what happens. Is he going to come out? Is this going to be effective? Are we going to be forgiven? Are everything going to be all right? Or are we in for a very bad time? They're waiting to see if he comes. And so from Psalm 141, verse 2, may my prayer be counted as incense before you. The lifting up of my hands is the evening offering. So a part of the sacrifice, sacrificial system is supposed to include our prayers and our praise. So prayer and praise. The lifting up of my hands is the evening offering to praise him. And the whole idea of lifting hands is an idea of lifting our hands towards the one who is greater than I. To praise him, to honor him, to pray to him. In Revelation 8, 3 and 4, we read, Another angel came in and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which is before the throne. So there's a golden altar of incense in glory where God is now. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. So we again get this picture of the incense involving the prayers of the people outside while the high priest is going inside to account for uh, atonement for the sins of the people. So thus the picture of Yeshua as the sacrifice and the great high priest is complete. He goes into heaven both to present his own blood, the prayers of the saints, and his own prayer of intercession for all who believe. So it's quite a beautiful picture when you stop and think about it. The Kumash, uh, this is a Jewish commentary on the Torah, connects the giving of the second set of tablets with Yom Kippur. So less than six weeks after Israel received the Ten Commandments, the nation toppled from its spiritual pinnacle and worshipped the golden calf. Moshe's long process of seeking forgiveness for his people ended on the 10th of Tishri when he came back from Sinai with the second tablets of the Torah. That day became ordained as Yom Kippur, the eternal day of forgiveness. Uh, the giving of a second set of tablets meant, I've forgiven you. Of course, he purged them first, right? How I many? About 3,000 people died. He purged them first, and then there was forgiveness, and, and the covenants kept, kept alive and moving in. Maybe a bit of a stretch. The Jewish scholars are trying to connect the more modern expressions of Yom Kippur, the events of the Exodus, and the Day of Atonement. They are not incorrect to associate a sense of forgiveness with the giving of the set, set of tablets. He forgave them or else they would still be stuck at Sinai. The preparations for the purification, verses 3 through 10. Aharon shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull for sin offering and a ram for burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic, and the linen undergarment shall be next to his body. And he shall be girded with a linen sash and attired with a linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for sin offering and one for ram for a burnt offering. Then Aharon shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household, meaning the priesthood. He shall take the two goats and present them before Adonai at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aharon shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Adonai, the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aharon shall offer the goat on which the lot for Adonai fell and make it a sin offering. But on the goat which had the lot for the scapegoat fell should be presented alive before Adonai to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. So in order for Aharon to approach the sanctuary the, for the cleansing of the various furnishings, he must first deal with his own sins and the sins of priesthood as a whole. Uh, thus he came first of all with a bull. So main focus to begin with is on the high priest. We must bear in mind that special events of the Day of Atonement did not displace the normal duties of the high priest for this day. He still had to do the normal morning offerings. If it was a Sabbath day, it involved more than just uh, the Ola, the one burnt offering. He still had to trim the wicks, fill the menorah with oil, offer the incense on the golden altar, and make that first Ola. So that's the three common things that went on every morning. And so he had to do all of this. Aaron would have already completed. Uh, he had completely bathed his body, put on the normal vestments, the priests, the beautiful robes, the purple, blue robes, the gorgeous ones, uh, with the bells on, on the uh, corners of the garment around the, the hem, and then the normal daily burnt offerings, which allowed the high priest, the regular priest, the Le pre Levites, and the people to approach God at, at all to begin with. And Exodus 28, 31 through 35 describes the normal gorgeous vestment of the high priest. We need to understand there's two different sets of clothing for him. And so when the people heard the tinkling of the bells on the hem of his garment, they knew they had a, a living high priest. 
That's how they knew, the tinkling of the bells. We know we have a living high priest because we have the Holy Spirit abiding in our hearts. So with what happened to Nadab and Avihu, this was very important because these two sons of Aharon died because they messed up. And so now they need to know for sure that Aharon don't mess up. And so we need to hear him. So the bells were there. And so a mistake in their minds would cost the life of the high priest and there would be no atonement that year. And so this glorious uh, vestment, you shall make the robe and the ephod all of blue, or some say purple. There shall be an opening at the top and the middle of it. Around the opening there shall be a binding of woven work like the opening of a coat of mail uh, so that it will not be torn. You shall make on its hem pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material all around on the hem and bells of gold between them all around. They actually found a little golden bell, by the way, and one of the archaeological digs around the city of David. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate all around the hem of the robe. It shall be on Aharon when he ministers, and the tinkling shall be heard when he enters and leaves the holy place before Adonai, so that he will not die. So uh, you've got the outer court, you've got the holy place, and the holy of holies. You don't go in the holy of holies dressed that way. Apparently you can go into that first section, but not the second. And so for this day, Aharon was lay aside those special vestments, bathed himself in water, put on the linen garments. So he would go to the temple. In fact, uh, for the day of, of Yom Kippur, he stayed at the temple overnight. The next morning he had bathed, put on the, the beautiful robes, do what he had to do there. He had bathed, put on the linen stuff, do what he had to do there. When he came back before the people, he had bathed again, put on the beautiful vestments. When he went back in before the Lord, he, he bathed and put on the holy vestments. And back and forth he would go. So quite a bit of cleansing, you see. Should tell us something about ourselves and our own walk with God. To keep ourselves clean and holy before him. So the white garments worn on Yom Kippur, and, and then only for the special portions that required him to go into the Holy of Holies, the sacred incense that's burned, and the service of the bull, the nation, the he-goat, sin offerings, all the regular daily rituals, and part of the Yom Kippur service as well are performed in the regular golden garments. So Alfred Edersheim, a Messianic Jew from some time back, back in the 1800s if I remember correctly, quoting from the Mishnah, uh, describes the links that they went to in the time of the second temple to prevent problems. So he says, seven days before the Day of Atonement, the high priest left his own house in Jerusalem and took up his abode in the chambers of the temple. A substitute was appointed for him just in case he should die or become Levitically unfit for his duties. Rabbinical punctiliousness went so far as to have him twice sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer. Want to make absolutely certain he was clean. On the third and seventh days of his week of separation, in case he had unwittingly to himself been defiled by a dead body. They've already separated him. So this is uh, kind of an old style Jewish thought in the Mishnah in the time of Yeshua. Uh, we want a double duty this thing. We want uh, no chance of anything happening. So during the whole week, he had to practice the various priestly rites, such as sprinkling the blood, burning the incense, lighting the lamp, offering the daily sacrifice, etc., etc. For as already stated, every part of that day's services dissolved, uh, devolved on the high priest what he did. Everything was dependent upon this one guy. Everything depended upon this one man. And he must not commit any mistake. And so our whole lives, our whole salvation experience is dependent upon one man, Yeshua, our Messiah who was holy and pure without any spot or wrinkle, and what he did for us to give us everlasting life. And so some of the elders of the Sanhedrin were appointed to see to it that the high priest fully understood and knew the meaning of the service. I mean, the priests are supposed to know this stuff, right? But uh, the Sanhedrin at the time of Yeshua, and again, this is from the Mishnah, Oral Torah written down at 8200. So some of the elders of the Sanhedrin to make sure the high priest understood, knew the meaning of the service, otherwise they were to instruct him in it. Do you understand the significance of what you're doing? On the eve of the Day of Atonement, the various sacrifices were brought before him that there might be nothing strange about the services of tomorrow. Finally, they bound him by a solemn oath not to change anything in the rites of the day. I know a lot of people who are so intent on keeping the holy day when they may not be so intent on keeping a relationship with the Holy One. And so the day doesn't mean anything if you don't have a relationship with the Holy One. Three important facts of the Day of Atonement must be kept in mind. Only on the Day of Atonement, once a year, the high priest and him alone allowed to go in the Holy of Holies. And on this day, he entered four times. 
and I'll share some where did I get some of this material from. On these occasions, he did not wear the golden vestments with the golden bells. He went inside there with the linen on. Only while officiating the special services of atonement did he wear the linen garments. These are holy garments. So a necessary frequent change of dress, and before each one, he bathed his whole body. On the rituals of this day began with the regular daily service, which on this day led by the high priest. True for every festival, the high priest offers up uh, the Ola, the high priest offers up the incense, the high priest trims the wicks, makes sure that it's full of oil, and keeps the lamp burning. Uh, no matter the festival, the twice uh, daily whole burnt offering, the Ola, always the first thing sacrificed, followed by the maintenance of the menorah and the burning of the incense in that order, uh, the very first necessary daily activities. So Chaim Shoss in the book, The Jewish Festival, describes it this way. First, the high priest conducted the bathhouse. The high priest bathes himself five times on this day. In addition, he washes his hands and feet ten times. These bathings and washings are performed in a special room in the temple near the court of the priests. The first bath, however, the one in the morning, takes place outside the innermost court beyond the water tower. You had to have a place to get water from there because... If you're familiar at all with the area around Jerusalem, they pipe their water into the old city of Jerusalem from 200 miles away today. It's a very dry area around there. And so Hezekiah's tunnel uh, and the water of that spring, you need a tower to store that water in. And so they had a water tower. Each time he bathes a curtain of byssus or costly linen is spread between him and the people. So he's got a place where he bathes. They hide his body while he's changing, but they know that he's there. Uh, he doffs his ordinary raiment, bathes, dons the golden vestments, washes his hands and feet in a golden basin, and starts the daily sacrifice. He performs it in his golden robes, and the congregation stands enthralled at the sight. From their point of observation, the high priest is a glowing spectacle with his golden diadem, little golden uh, plate, little crown on his turban that said, Holy to Adonai. And his precious gems on his breast, the stones on the, on the coson, the breastplate, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The precious gems, the golden bells which hang on the hem of his purple robe, which tinkled every movement. Everything was polished and had a brilliant appearance from the sun. Then he goes to the ante room in order to burn the incense upon the golden altar and put the lamps of the menorah in order. This ends the regular daily service. Now comes the special Yom Kippur service for which the high priest dons garments of white linen. He's led to the bathhouse near the court of the priest. He washes his hands and feet, divests himself of the ceremonial golden robes, bathes himself, puts on the garments of white linen again, washes hands and feet. Washed his hands and feet when he got done, took off that, bathed, and then put on the linen. So constantly cleansing. That's the way the priest's life was, constantly cleansing themselves. And it should tell us something about our own lives and our relationship with the Lord. Keep on cleansing ourselves. Each time he changed his raiment, the high priest was separated from the people by a linen cloth. They could not see him, but they could hear the sound of the bells as he went back and forth with the changes of clothing. The white linen or holy garments and stood for the purity that the ritual was producing for everyone. The high priest, the priesthood, the people, and the Mishkan itself. There's very strong similarity in this dress in that the description of the angel of the Lord, uh, which we understand to be Yeshua. We reread this in Daniel 10, Revelation uh, chapter 1 and Ezekiel 9 and chapter 10. Uh, several sacrifices are laid out here. A bull for a sin offering for Aharon and the priests. A ram for burnt offering for Aharon and the priests. Two male goats for a sin offering for the people. A ram for burnt offering for the people. A lot of sacrifices going on besides the normal daily ones. Typical Jewish understanding has it in verse 6 before anything else is done. The high priest first dealt with his own personal sins by virtue of a bull for a sin offering for himself. Then proceed to the other rites of Yom Kippur, lay his hands on the head of the young bull, and confess his own sins first. So they see uh, in this something different than I do. I think what he does, he explains what they're going to do, and then he explains as he does what he already told you he was going to do. Good Hebrew way of doing things. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to explain it, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. Go into detail. So the typical Jewish understanding uh, was that he had to do this. And so he said, this is actually quoted from the to Mishnah. I beseech thee, O Lord, I have sinned. I've been iniquitous. I have transgressed against thee, O Lord. Pardon the sins, iniquities, and transgressions which I've committed against thee. So sins, ka, uh, kata, iniquities, avon, and transgressions. I forget the third word from Hebrew. 
which I've committed against thee, I and my household, as it is said, on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you for all your sins shall be clean before Adonai. All your sins shall be clean, forgiven. Being an imperfect human being, the high priest had to deal with his own sins and those of his fellow priests in order for them to continue to function in the priesthood for another year. And before the high priest could hope to actuate any cleansing for the tabernacle, he must first bring cleansing to himself. So even though this was according to God's prescription, he must seek to cleanse himself before he continued the work God had called him to do on this day of atonement. So Hebrews 7, 23 through 28 contrasts Yeshua as our great high priest. The former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Yeshua, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. He is forever our great high priest. He is forever our Savior. He is forever the prophet expected by the people and forever the king. Forever prophet, priest, and king. And from the very beginning, he was all three. Therefore, he is able, verse 25, to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He prays for us. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the Torah appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the Torah appoints a son, made perfect forever. So the concept of pure and sanctified high priest most surely points us to the point of the coming of Messiah. He would be sinless, pure, and holy in and of himself and offer up a better sacrifice since he was sinless, his own life being the most pure offering, his own holiness enabling him to function as our great high priest. And it's so interesting, even the Apostle Paul uh, talks about uh, the Jews who killed uh, Yeshua. And John says, well, he laid down his own life. Nobody took it from him. But the Jews saw to it. They said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. So what we're talking about in the Jews, we'll talk about tonight because what he was talking about, there was not all the Jewish people, but the religious authority that called for that. Not all the Jewish people. But that's tonight's lesson. So let me get back to this one. The high priest's confession was made in the area between the porch of the temple and the altar. The primary atonement of an offering is affected by the blood service, not by the confession, but the confession is an essential part of repentance and hence of atonement. Very important statements. The primary atonement of an offering is affected by the blood, not by the confession, but the confession is an essential part of repentance and hence of atonement. If we don't repent, if we don't change our mind, if we don't want to stop doing it, then uh, it's not very effective at all. It's like saying sorry, but what we mean is I don't want to have to pay for what I just did rather than truly being sorry and try to be different. So it's one of God's greatest gifts that he permits a person to erase the sins of his past so that he can begin a better life, a life unhampered by the corrosive effects of past sins. Such a new beginning is not possible unless the sinner has repented by confronting his misdeeds, acknowledging them, sincerely resolving to change. This is represented uh, by confession. In fact, according to Rambam, the commandment to repent is embodied in the commandment to confess. And this is from the Kumash. You would think Apostle Paul may have written this, but the Kumash did. Unfortunately, the Kumash doesn't believe in Yeshua the Messiah. We cannot and must not overlook the necessity of real confession, however, uh, in our approach to God. To confess and repent are vital parts of the process of redemption. Repent was the call of both Yochanan Habatdil, uh, John the Baptist, and Yeshua the Messiah. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So to confess is to agree with God. I confess, I agree with you, Lord. This is bad. This is evil. This is ungodly. This is horrid. This is black. This is of the devil. So the world is not of you, O oh God. And so agree with God. And repent means to turn our back on that sin while turning our face towards God. Don't want that anymore. I'm turning away from that. Turn to you. Most all of us come to a point in time we have to say, I don't want that anymore. I want God and turn away from that to turn to, to him. And so this is true Teshuvah. And so it was an extremely important part of the picture of Yom Kippur and associates with a, us with the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. 
And it's not as though the process of dealing with sin was ineffective in the past. Uh, would we really believe that uh, when David gave us Psalm 51 or Psalm 32, that God didn't forgive him of his sin? Would we really think that God didn't forgive anybody in that past? How did they make it along the way if they, he didn't? Have, if there was no real effectiveness here. Sins were dealt with by the blood of Yeshua. And it's as if from that, that time they understood the coming of Messiah to pay for those sins. But there was some sense of the word that they were truly forgiven. And so real forgiveness had to be genuine repentance and change. The concept of a change greatly enhanced in the new covenant. The next part involving the goats was performed on the eastern side of the altar took close to the people. Leviticus 16, 5 says the two goats and the one ram are taken from the congregation of the sons of Israel. Symbolizes the fact that the Messiah, the ultimate sacrifice, would come from among the people of Israel. He symbolizes the two lambs, the two goats, the one ram. Uh, is separate. At the time of Yeshua, we find a disdain for those untrained at the feet of the rabbis, and some regard that Galilee is inferior in a place from which no prophet would arise, and they somehow miss this scripture. Uh, the goats and the ram come from among the congregation of the sons of Israel, not from the priests, but from the people of Israel. The two goats were to be as identical as possible, the same size, same appearance, same cost. The two goats were positioned near the altar in full view of the people so that one could be chosen by a lot as a sacrifice. The other selected as a scapegoat. The Hebrew had a need to stand is used in respect to persons who were made to stand in the presence of God near the altar. So when they were dealing with uh, bad situations, they would bring them close to the altar to stand before where God was. And so they would do so much there uh, out in that courtyard. And so to stand... Uh, near the altar when purification rites were about to be formed on their behalf or sacrifices made. So God was to view them and find them deserving of purification. Both goats were an offering, and in urn were two golden tablets, identical except for the wording. One's inscribed to Adonai, La Adonai, the other La Azel, Azazel, excuse me. The high priest would then put both hands into the urn, withdraw both lots without looking at them, and place them on the head of each goat. And Alfred Edersheim again describes the following again from the Mishnah. The lot having designated each of the two goats, the high priest tied a tongue-shaped piece of scarlet cloth to the horn of the goat for Azazel, the so-called scapegoat, and another round the throat of the goat for Adonai, which was to be slain. The goat that was to be sent forth was now turned round towards the people and stood facing them, waiting, as it were, until their sins should be laid on him, and he would carry them forth into a land not inhabited. Quote, unquote. Assuredly, a more marked type of Messiah could not be conceived. As he was brought forth by Pilate and stood before the people, just as he was about to be led forth, bearing the iniquity of the people. And as if to add to the significance of the rite, tradition has it that when the sacrifice was fully accepted, the scarlet mark which the scapegoat had borne became white to symbolize the gracious promise in Isaiah 118. Behold, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall become white as snow. But it adds that this miracle did not take place for 40 years before the destruction of the temple. Next, the high priest sacrificed the young bull, but now confessed also the sins of the priests, saying, I am my household and the sons of Aharon, thy holy tribe. The blood of the bull was gathered into a basin and given to a waiting priest that kept stirring the blood so it would not coagulate. The high priest then went to the altar burnt offering, filled a censer with burning coals, Two, took two handfuls of frankincense and entered the Holy of Holies the first time. The center of, uh, center of incense placed upon the foundation stone. So interesting, a foundation stone, the Ark of the Covenant on solid bedrock, a foundation stone for this whole structure, so to speak. And so he put it on that foundation stone, the Holy of Holies filled with the smoke of the censer. The purpose of the cloud of incense to protect the high priest while he stood in the immediate area of God's presence, his Shekinah, Kabod, or glory. He went out to the holy place to pray as the people also prayed. The high priest then retrieved the blood of the bull. Somebody's keeping that thing stirring so it wouldn't coagulate and still pour. Returned to the Holy of Holies, sprinkled the blood upon the caparet, or in the times of the second temple where it used to stand. As he emerged, he placed the bowl of blood in front of the veil. 
Then he sacrificed the goat marked for Adonai. Once more he entered into the Holy of Holies and he sprinkled the blood just as he did with the blood of the bull. He also additionally ceremonially cleansed the sanctuary, the veil, the golden altar of incense, the holy place from the defilement of priests and worshipers. So he put blood everywhere. On the caparet, golden altar of incense, the golden menorah, the golden table of showbread, the pyrocat itself, he cleansed everything. And once more for another year, there was free access for all to come to God in the temple. This was the purification, the sealing up of a route of entry leading to the inward from the incense altar to the parroquet, the curtain, to the ark, and to the caparet. This necessitated uh, by the entrance of a mortal human being into the sanctuary. The whole design, given in part to teach us that sin hindered access to the presence of God. The high priest had to be first absolved of his sin in order to enter in and perform his high priestly function, and the whole process had to be repeated year after year. And this all points us to the one who would accomplish atonement for all people for all time by one act of sacrifice and is going into the original throne room of God. And by his going in, serving as our high priest, he gives us access, boldness to enter uh, through him to the presence of God in our prayers regularly. And so he's going into the original throne room of God. And so we read this in Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. 20 through 26 in Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Traditions expressed in the Mishnah based on Isaiah 118 states that a cord of red wool tied in the temple. So uh, we first read that it was tied across the goat, but there was also a thread perhaps uh, tied in the temple. And after the sacrifices, the red wool turned white as a sign that God forgave the people's sin. And so was there two or was there one? Does it say different way in different places? I don't know. Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together, says Adonai. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And so from the Babylonian Talmud tract, Yoma, the priest used to tie, uh, used to bind a shining crimson strip of cloth on the outside door of the temple. If the strip of cloth turned wh into the white color, they would rejoice. If it did not turn white, they were full of sorrow and shame. He didn't forgive us. And so from uh, the Babylonian Talmud here, so I may say it differently in the uh, Mishnah from the Babylonian Talmud. The great sages teach the Shekinah, the glory of God, left the temple 40 years prior to its destruction because Israel's sins were so great. Three signs occurred to show the evidence of this. This is all from the Mishnah. The western candle of the menorah refused to burn continually, the one they're supposed to keep burning all the time. The doors of the temple would open of themselves. Well, we know the outside curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. Well, when Yeshua, Yeshua died. And the red will no longer turn white supernaturally, especially significant because it indicated God was no longer forgiving the sins of his people. The people were sorrowful because they began to realize more and more that the sacrifice of Yom Kippur did not have the power to cleanse their sinful hearts. Well, that's because guess who had come? Messiah had come. If this is true, the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. 70 minus 40 yields 30. Around 30 A.D., Yeshua started his earthly ministry the very year that the blood of the bull. Um, all right, so I, somehow I erased part of my stuff here. So the very, the very time the blood of the bull was being sacrificed. No, that's not right. I'm sorry. Pardon? You know, he, he died at uh, Passover, of course. So around it, he started his earthly ministry about uh, AD 30, and uh, somehow I erased this. I don't know how I did that. I do stuff crazy sometimes. But the idea of the point here is he began at 30, 40 years before the destruction of the temple. It quit turning white. Why? Because Yeshua had come and died. And he was the only means by which salvation could uh, be occurred anymore. And so God wasn't using that process of atonement. Atonement through Yeshua. So this is in the Mishnah. It's amazing that they include in the Mishnah evidence for us to believe that Yeshua, our Messiah, is truly the only means of redemption for us. All this time, the Azazel stood facing the congregation. The high priest now laid his hands on the scapegoat, confessed the sins of the people, the house of Israel. As he prayed for the third time, we're told that he 
uh, turned toward the people and said, be, Behold, the Lord, before the Lord you shall be clean. Take this goat away. Then led away out of the temple, out of the city of Jerusalem, out into the wilderness to a land not inhabited, is the way it's described in our scriptures. Thus God removed the sins of the people of Israel far away from them. As Psalm 103, 12 puts it, as far as the east is from the west, to a land of no return. The idea and the concept is that sin is not to return to the people. It's gone. Dealt with once and for all. And as God says through Jeremiah in that new covenant of Jeremiah 31 through 34, I will remember their sins no more. They're gone. Can God forget anything? Or does he simply say, I will remember them to you no more. I've dealt with them. They're done. I won't call them up to you. See, our problem is people. As we remember every bad thing you did to me. And by God, I'm going to make you remind, be reminded of them. You know, that's what we do oftentimes in marriages and in family relationships, people with people. And that's not God's way. I will remember your sins no more. I don't think you can forget anything but what he said. I'm not going to think on those. I've cleansed you. They're gone. So this was taken to a land of no return, an idea concept that sin is not to return to the people. Two goats, one sacrifice. Some liken them to the death and resurrection of Messiah Yeshua, that one goat died and the other lived. Death happens and yet life happens at the same time. Two aspects of the same person, two roles in his life that he fulfilled. Died for our sins, rose again to ensure to us we have everlasting life and a resurrection life that is to come. So he's the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 135. On the other hand, we've already seen in Hebrews 7 above, he is an eternal high priest. Whoever lives to make intercession for his people. He died, yet he lives. He rose from the dead, ascended to the heavenly new Jerusalem, and in the presence of God presented there his blood sacrifice. Before the altar, the throne of God continues to live and function there as our high priest. And so doing, he performed the same word as the high priest did on Yom Kippur, entering the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood before the sacrifice, of the sacrifice before the presence of God. Well, all right. We've got about four more pages of notes. We're not going to get through all those. And I think we're probably at a, an appropriate time just to, just to stop. I'm going to skim down through this just a little bit. The scapegoat, uh, verses 20 through 22, when he finishes atoning for the holy place, the tent of me, the altar, he shall offer the live goat. It's like he explains everything, then he says, all right, now that I explained it, here's when we did it. And he goes through it all over again. Why? Because it's so important. And so he confesses the iniquities over uh, the sons of Israel and their transgressions regard to all their sins. And so we acknowledge the symbol of the scapegoat taking away our sins from us. So Mitchens the Hava Glazer in their book, Fall, Fest, Fall Feast of Israel, make a rather unique connection. They ask the question, where does the New Testament teach that our sins are removed through a sacrifice? John the Baptist combined the idea of the Azazel with a Passover lamb. Standing on the stones of the Jordan River, John cried, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, takes sin away. Something the blood of bulls and goats couldn't possibly do. But Yeshua did. And the people were to understand there's one coming greater than this high priest. One's coming who is going to be pure and holy. And he can do what this high priest can't do. And once for all, he'll deal with our sins and take them away. Uh, did they really understand all this? We see again and again through the uh, Tanakh, through the Old Testament scriptures. But they knew a heck of a lot more than what our scriptures tell us they knew. And did they know and understand a coming one? According to looking at the Akita. As we discussed just recently, Abraham expected a Messiah, and Messiah Yeshua himself says in the book of John, he longed to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. He understood the coming of a Messiah. So would they understand this? They should have. They understand the coming of a Messiah. So behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yeshua is not only the slain Lamb who protects us from the wrath of God, Exodus 12. He is not merely a sheep led silently to the slaughter, Isaiah 53. He is also the Azazel, Leviticus 16, for through his death the sins of all who believe are completely removed. So it's just an interesting uh, look at take of things. And uh, makes, a, makes a, I think, a very good connection. And then we're final offerings uh, of the day of the Yom Kippur ceremony, uh, verses 23 through 28. 
And uh, so, again, there's, there's more offerings and cleansing going on, but we've, we've run close enough to time. We're going to end with this. I think there's just a couple more pages of notes here, but uh, we're going to end with that. And the final verses, there's a commandment for doing Yom Kippur once a year. So it goes through a very in-depth uh, discussion and look at these things. And so what we're tempted to do today is to try to take a look at the Day of Atonement and understand Yeshua in that Day of Atonement because we've uh, been in the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 11 right now. and We're taking a sign for these things, but we've dealt with the idea uh, in chapters 8, 9, and 10 that Yeshua uh, was a fulfillment of the Day of Atonement and his death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. We'll end with that and see if you have any questions or comments. Yes, sir. I have a few. Go ahead. No. No. The story of Chosen People Ministries, uh, Rabbi Leopold Cohen had studied to become a rabbi. And so in the Jewish world, you cannot know the Word of God without looking at the Talmud. So what they're trained in is in the Talmud. And so the story of how he got saved after he had studied to become a rabbi, had studied the Talmud, he said, I'm going to read our Bible. And so he began reading the book of Isaiah got to chapter 53 and got saved because of what Isaiah 53 said. They do not read the Bible like you and I think we read the Bible. They're, they're, they're taught through the Talmud, typically, these days. And Where do I get this information? I get this information from saved Jews, uh, from much of the Jewish people that are a part of chosen people ministries are born-again Jews. And so... They've written and talked about a lot of this sort of thing, so this is where we get this information from. Uh, we think they know their Bible. No, they know the Talmud. They know what the rabbi teaches, what the rabbis have taught, what Rambam said, what Radak said. Uh, they know these great sages from back in the medieval times, uh, Maimonides. They know what those guys said. Yep. Correct, yes. They trust their rabbi. They trust the rabbis. They trust the sages of old. It is not for some. Some people do read. Yes, ma'am. They've been taught for so long, right, right. Right. So on the side of the church, what's happened for a lot of churches, a lot of congregations is they think the church replaced Israel. And so we don't need all that Old Testament stuff. We're, we're the new Israel. We replaced them. Yeah, new covenant idea. New covenant begins in Matthew, not Jeremiah. Yes, ma'am.
did, yes. Had some roots, but they didn't understand those roots too well, and Bright did. Right. Which we have to. So we have to t divest ourselves of some of that that you're talking about, uh, that the church has done, and embrace some of the Hebrew, and uh, not give away from our Savior, but uh, nonetheless, to try to understand the center of this, and that's on Yeshua, and uh, see him in, in both light. Jeremiah 6. Yes, well, Jeremiah was writing to a bunch of Jews who were not listening and not obeying God at the time, so to go back to ancient paths and listen to what God says and, and do what he said, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. They need to understand. So Dr. Walter Kaiser uh, has this concept, and he developed this after reading uh, a very early Presbyterian um, gentleman by the name of uh, Beecher. And so he developed his idea of the promise plan of God. The promise plan of God is based on the covenants. Every covenant points us to Yeshua. Every covenant points us to Yeshua. The very first one, that Adam and Hava and Gan Eden, uh, of your seed, is coming one who's going to crush the head of that serpent, Satan. And so that tells us uh, very beginning that there's, there's this unique one coming. And so that there is a promised plan of God, and all the covenants point us to the same Savior, every covenant. Uh, the covenants are eternal. And so what the church has done is decided that with the coming of Yeshua, that that's a new thing, that's a new covenant, and all the old is made obsolete and thrown away, and that's not at all the case. It's simply a fulfillment of all the other covenants and all the other things still stand. And so Dr. Kaiser, he doesn't go where we do, but he gives us a good strength and understanding here about how these covenants all point us to the one promise, Messiah, the one promise that comes to save us. And so all these covenants still have an effect upon us. And while he would say that that means that uh, we don't go throw away all the commandments of God he, he would say that it does eliminate the rituals of the sacrificial system which I still disagree with uh, because Ezekiel seems to describe there'll be sacrifices again in the millennial kingdom so we'll, we'll return to those sacrifices why same reason that I have my mother and dad's picture in my hallway remind me of them and so the, why would we sacrifice again to remind us the cost of our salvation? Remind us what Messiah has done for us. A remembrance. Remember. Covenant term. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Remember what I've done for you. Remember the actions of God. The whole point of the Bible is to keep remembering. And see, God's been active with his people. God's been after his people. God's been reaching out to his people. God's been calling upon them. He brought them out of Egypt. He made them a nation again in 1948. Why? No other country has ever come back after so many years of not having a nation until May of 1948. God is reaching out for his people. God's done this. God's done this. God's done this. God's done this. How do you know God is real? God called them out of Egypt. God brought them through the Amorites. God brought them through the Canaanites. God brought them uh, through the exiles. God made them a nation again. This is why I believe God's real. The God of the Jews. He is our God. Uh, we do not displace Israel because we get saved as a Gentile. We become a part of Israel, grafted in as fellow believers. And we must never lose sight of that. I don't believe, and the question's asked, question's asked, and I believe that the uh, Messiah Matters has dealt with this a bit. So uh, Rob and Caleb from uh, uh, Tor Resource up there. Um, when a Jew believes, are they no longer Jewish? Was, if a Gentile believes, is he now a Jew and not a Gentile anymore? No. We still maintain our ethnic identities. But we're made one in the body of Messiah. One group, one people of God. And we bring our ethnicity with us. Uh, we are followers of God. Does that make us like the Jews? We've crossed over, as it were, into a, a new way of understanding and believing. 
but we still carry our ethnicity. I didn't all of a sudden become dark-skinned and brown-eyed. And so in that sense, I still have my, my ethnicity, which is a very weird one. I ran my DNA. It's very strange, so I'll tell you that story at a time. Any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Good question, and uh, there's a couple of different ideas. So our, our translators typically say uh, out into a nowhere land where it can't come back. So some suggest that Azazel means to the evil one. So sin is taken back to where it began, sent out into the wilderness to the demons and the devil himself. It's just one take on it. I'm not going to follow my sword either way, but that's at least one idea is that uh, the one to Azazel means you send the sins back where it came from. There's, the, there's a way that they play with the word Azazel. And so you can break the word down into more than one word and uh, come up with a different meaning for it. And so two, I forget how it works. I don't have those notes in front of me right now. But yeah, it says basically back to the devil where it came from. That's one idea of it. Yes, sir. get used to those traditions that we've been taught for a hundred thousand years and we want to just it's hard it's, it's hard to change your mind about something you believe for 20 and 30 years and sometimes we have to do that anyway be open-minded as we read the bible and study that's a, that's a hard place to be there are certain things that are not up for question the deity of my messiah that he died born again uh, because he died and rose again and ascended the right hand of god the father um, that's not up for discussion. Um, but there's a lot of things that are not salvation issues that can be up for discussion. And uh, there's a lot of questions that I have. The more I study, the more questions I have. Do I think I know everything? No. Do I think anybody knows everything? No, I don't. I don't think there's any one person knows everything. If for no other reason, there's too much figurative language and symbols used, particularly in the apocalyptic literature, that we may not ever understand uh, this side of heaven because... We're not Middle Eastern. We didn't grow up in that time. And the symbols that meant something to them there at that point in time may not mean the same thing in the same land in a modern day. And so what do these symbols mean? And so we, uh, we may be, you know, figuring that out for a long time yet. So I don't think any one person can know everything. I certainly don't. I will never profess myself to know. I just keep studying, trying to learn. That's all we can do. And point each other to the Lord and to the Word of God. That's what that's our, our focus is on the Lord. Our main rabbi is named Yeshua. He's he's the rabbi we follow and study his word because uh, people are gonna make mistakes. I make mistakes. But Rabbi Yeshua doesn't make mistakes. And the word of God is sure. So we keep keep focus where it belongs. Anyone else before we quit? Yes, sir, Mason. God's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they're still alive. So he affirmed that resurrection to them because uh, the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. And that was their point, trying to capture him. Bad joke.
The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're so sad, you see. Sorry. Told you it was a bad joke before I said it. Yes. Well, let's uh, stand. We'll uh, conclude with the round of benediction. As our lunchtime is calling us. I've been smelling food for a while back there. Shalom. May Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Adonai lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar Shalom. The name of Yeshua, Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. And Shabbat Shalom. And we'll have Onegs, we'll say a Hamotzi. Baruch Atai Adonai, Eloheinu Malakawalam, Hamotzi Lakam Min Haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth.